understand what they were doing. Sometimes it looked like clerical work. It looked like they were secretaries. And why would we bother writing history books about secretaries? That's not interesting and it doesn't seem important. So we've got these, these reasons developing as to why women are traditionally missing from the historical record when it comes to the world of intelligence and espionage. So let's, let's have a look, what were they doing? This woman here, this is Denise Miley, and she is a radar operator. So the equipment that she's using there is brand new equipment. This equipment has been developed for this specific purpose for war at this point. Um, radar was being, radio direction finding was being developed in the late 1930s, but the coming of war is always a catalyst for technological development. It encourages technological development and it pushes things along at a much quicker rate than we would think, you know, how the pandemic pushed the development of vaccines through very quickly because the situation, circumstance, forces something to happen much quicker than it normally would. So the development of, of technology in the Second World War is also an arena in which women play a role. They're the ones who are left on the home front back in Britain. So they are the ones that will have to learn to use this new technology. It's highly likely at this point that women like Denise Miley in this picture have had little to no education in mathematics, physics, chemistry, um, anything that you might need to use, engineering, anything you might need to use this kind of equipment. So where a man in peacetime might be given two years to train fully with brand new equipment that he'd never seen before, a woman, a woman who has very little to no experience with this kind of equipment is probably given a matter of weeks to have to get very adept at using it. So they learn very fast, they have to. Um, and, and that's something that is not always expected of them to be able to learn that fast because they learn things like cookery and sewing in school. They don't learn how to use radio direction finding equipment or how to drive a lorry. So it's really a case of them having to learn very fast um, and very effectively. So what is Denise Miley doing? <laughs> Radio direction finding um, was a, a new kind of concept in the Second World War. And when you have an air force that outnumbers yours by roughly two to one, brute force simply is not an option. You cannot afford to go into the Battle of Britain with an inferior air force in size anyway, uh, thinking that you can win by means of planes and men alone. The few were incredibly courageous, but they could not have won this battle if it weren't for what happened behind the scenes. And Denise Miley is the first point of contact. She is a WAF radar operator. So what does radar do? I am fairly confident that there will be people listening to this who have a much better understanding of what radar does than I do. The exact science involved um, is, is not something that I am uh, a, a big, in a big way understanding, but I roughly understand the concept, which hasn't changed. Um, the rough concept of radar is exactly the same today as it was in the Second World War. You have a radio beam or pulse. Um, and it's sent out across the channel. And when it makes contact with an aircraft, it will be, it will ping the aircraft and it will be sent back. And when it is sent back to Britain, this lady and her colleagues will see it appear on that screen in front of them. And it will give them information about an incoming German raid. It will tell them things like, how many aircraft are in this raid? How fast are they going? What direction are they flying in? What is their bearing? Things that you can see are very, very useful for the Royal Air Force to know. So women like this would be usually based in huts on the edges of the south coast of Britain. 
and there were stations all around Britain actually but the south coast geographically is the part that we're worried about um, because it's it's the direction that the German aircraft are going to come from. So they are sitting on the, the south coast of Britain in these huts on cliff tops. Um, and the catch is for radar to work effectively, you need 360 foot tall towers to send out those pulses. Those are visible from the air. So the Luftwaffe can see this equipment. They can guess that it's important. And that makes what these women are doing highly dangerous because they are a bombing target for the Luftwaffe. So they are sitting there collecting this information. Sometimes they can even see a raid take off in France, in occupied France. Um, so they can tell that early on what the Luftwaffe is doing. And we have reports from German pilots as they arrive over Britain being absolutely furious uh, because there's a welcoming committee there for them. There is an RAF unit uh, of fighter aircraft, anti-aircraft artillery, um, and they, they get over British shores and they can't get any further because what Denise Miley has done, what women like her have done, has, has allowed the RAF to know in what strength the enemy is going to show up exactly where at exactly what time. And that information is force multiplying and it is life-saving. So this is incredibly important work. That information though, that she's collecting, that these women on the coast are collecting is useless if it does not get to where it needs to go. So the system in which intelligence moves and we call it the intelligence cycle today. So we, we would collect information, but, but then we have to disseminate it to people who can make it make sense. Analysts can look at it and make it make sense. So that information goes from the point of contact on the coast to this room here. This is a filter room. Those women around the table, those are also members of the Women's Auxiliary Air Force. They are taking that information, they can hear it in their headsets that they're wearing. It's coming in um, basically every three to four minutes, roughly. So this is real time intelligence um, and they are depicting it on a map of Britain. So the RAF commanders who are above them, they're on the balcony, at any given point during the Battle of Britain can see exactly what is happening in the air over Britain. They can see the air picture, the air intelligence picture, and it's only ever delayed by two to four minutes. So this is pretty, pretty up to date information. Um, and these women are keeping it that way. So they are working long, difficult shifts. Just to give you an example of what one of them would be hearing through their headphones. Uh, this, this is what they'd be hearing. Hostile 0140 plus H Harry 3020 Northwest. I don't know about you. I've tried this. I've personally tried this in, a, in an operations room in a, in a Battle of Britain bunker in, in London. Um, you, you hear that information and you're supposed to depict it on the map straight away. And you may not have even finished doing so before the next one comes in. It is extremely difficult work. Um, and by the sort of mid to end of the Battle of Britain, almost all of the women doing it um, are doing it very, very effectively. They're almost all women. So they've gone from having all men in these rooms to all women. And the reason for that was the women had this, this quality. And I don't know if this can be adequately translated into Arabic or see, it was called unflappability, which meant that they couldn't easily be bothered they couldn't easily be wound up um, and they they were unflappable um, which is is something that again wasn't expected of them to be able to do this work and it's quick it's constant it never stops because the Germans never stop so this information is constantly being generated and sent from where it is, is received to where it needs to be oops these are the women doing the sending so we we want to look at women like this and go, okay, they're typists, they're secretaries. What they're doing is boring, frankly. Um, I've never seen a book written about secretaries in the Second World War because it wouldn't make for interesting reading. 
but they're not secretaries, they are disseminators. So that stage in the intelligence cycle, you've got collection, analysis, production, um, and then it's going between stages. It doesn't just get there magically. There are people like this sat at their desk for eight hours a day during that sending. Um, and without them, this information, all the technology is entirely useless. Um, and women in their thousands, by the end of the Second World War, tens of thousands make up the communications network. They are the backbone of the communications network in all of the armed services in the UK. So that is important work. Next time you see a picture of a woman in uniform typing, um, don't assume that what she's doing is boring and unimportant work. So we've got women collecting the information. We've got them sending it. We've got them processing it and analyzing it. Um, what then happens to it? It's used. That's what makes uh, intelligence important, isn't it? It becomes operational, it is acted on. Um, and, and as we've established, a lot of that information would lead to the scrambling of RAF fighter squadrons, the few, the pilots who can fly into battle against the Luftwaffe and hopefully um, either shoot them down or send them home before they manage to get over London to do any damage through bombing. But it's not the only action that um, is a result of this intelligence. There is also anti-aircraft artillery that can be deployed. And that's what these women are doing. So just to give you an idea of how wide the scope is of women in the, in the British military services, they're even acting on intelligence. So these women are anti-aircraft ATS, so they're British Army. Um, and as you can see, they are on a break from working on anti-aircraft guns. So they are watching the skies for incoming raids that managed to get through the first line of defences. So really they are throughout the system. Um, and, and if you take the intelligence cycle, there's not a single part of it where they are not working actively in quite large numbers by, by the end of the Battle of Britain and into the Second World War. And as radar technology continues to develop, so does their role. Um, you get ground control and interception radar is brought in during the blitz, which can track enemy aircraft at night. Um, and they are trained on the job to use that equipment as it develops, so does their training. Uh, and they're very adept at it. These ladies are teleprinter women. So they are a whole unit designed specifically to send information from A to B. Um, that is what, that says teleprinter course there, that's because they've just passed their teleprinter course. Um, I think some of them look quite proud about it um, because they knew, they knew how important their work was. They knew that this information needed to get to a commander, a military commander in the field and without them, that wouldn't happen. What about um, other areas in which WAF worked? We now know that they worked in the integrated air defense system in, in Great Britain, which was known as the Dowding system. You may have heard of it. Um, but they also worked in lots of other areas of British intelligence in, in the Air Force. Three guesses where these women worked. The aircraft behind them is a fairly good giveaway. Bomber Command, RAF Bomber Command. So we've got women working in fighter command who are dealing with Britain's kind of defense, uh, their fighter defense. These women are working in an offensive capacity. So they're working for bomber command to assist with allied bombing operations. So taking the fight from Britain to the enemy. And they are working largely um, in different areas of, of bombing operations that involve planning and briefing. So the aim of Bomber Command is to diminish Germany's ability to continue to fight the war. There are four distinct stages to a bomber operation. Planning, number one. Number two, briefing your air crew. Number three, the raid is carried out. And number four, debriefing the air crew. These women standing here in front of the aircraft, they look nice in their uniforms. 
um, they're smiling, they've got a trophy. But it was much, much more than that. Their, their everyday role was absolutely critical to what Bomber Command was doing. They are involved in planning bombing raids. How? Lots of ways. They are looking for bombing targets. At this point, the RAF is looking to carry out strategic bombing. We want to take out um, enemy oil fields, enemy factories, enemy transport depots, anything that will hurt the Axis war effort. Bomber Command is looking to, to destroy strategically useful targets. The WAF are involved in locating those targets, identifying those targets, using photographic intelligence and reconnaissance. So they take, there are literally millions of photos generated by Allied aerial reconnaissance in the Second World War. And a lot of the time it is women who are looking at those images and saying, okay, there is an aircraft factory. If we blow it up, the Luftwaffe has fewer aircraft strategic bombing there is um the map side of things it's very difficult for bomber command crews to carry out raids if they don't know where they are going probably impossible so what the WAF do is keep huge libraries of maps maps of of ally uh, of, of enemy occupied territory um these maps are collected from all over the place um, and, and, and WAF map clerks, who again look like clerks, they look like office personnel, can lay their hands on a map of, of any given area within minutes. They know the library inside out and they can provide bomber crews with maps of where they're going, which is fairly critical to their success. They provide bomber crews with what are known as flimsies, uh, flimsy is is a word that means something is very um, fragile normally and that's because what they were giving the air crews were very 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 thin pieces of rice paper that had their bombing targets uh, their call signs all this this intelligence that they needed to carry out a bombing raid but it was on rice paper so that if they were shot down they could eat it and keep it out of enemy hands. So the WAF are preparing those, they're putting information on rice paper and handing it to the crews with their maps <laughs> and anything else that they need in order to carry out their raid. <laughs> they are keeping information on numbers of aircraft, losses, <laughs> bomb loads, routes that are taken to target. Times and information from pilot interrogations, all sorts of information. <laughs> Apologies, I am homesick today. They're also helping crews during raids. So often you get these bomber aircraft that are limping home from a bombing raid. <laughs> Apologies. And they've sustained damage. They've maybe sustained injury. Um, and their planes are, are in a bad way. The WAF are on the other end of radio communications, helping them to get home, guiding them into blacked out airfields. So they're, they're saving lives and commodities in that way as well. They are also instrumental um, after a raid. And this is something that I found <laughs> very, very interesting. One of the reasons the British authorities did not want women involved in intelligence work, and they didn't, was because they feared they'd become too emotional. They thought intelligence work brings you face to face with the ugliness of war, um, with the harsh reality of war. And that's, that's true, isn't it? You know, they're looking at aerial reconnaissance photos that sometimes involve um, beheaded prisoners in prisoner of war camps. This is grisly stuff. This is unpleasant stuff. <laughs> and the British authorities are concerned that if they put women in intelligence roles, they will become hysterical. Emotionally, they won't be able to cope. Um, 
and, and one of the roles in particular that they want to keep them away from is debriefing bomber crews. When bomber crews come back from operations over occupied territory, they have in their heads information. They alone know how the raids have gone. They alone know if they need to go back and bomb these places again. And it's the job of bomber crew interrogators to get that information out of them. They did not want WAF to do that. These men are coming home traumatized. They may have watched their friends go down in flames. They may have seen terrible things. They most likely have seen terrible things. They're exhausted, they're injured. It's very, very tough work. Um, and for the longest time, the, the RAF just didn't want women to do that job. They thought it would be too hard for men to open up to women about the horrors of war. But manpower crisis, uh, in the end, they have no choice but to put women in that role. And guess what? They proved very, very good at it. So women, you know, we've got this long standing idea that women are emotional creatures. Um, but the WAF, you know, they, they found a way to kind of deploy that as useful. Um, and actually their emotional sensitivity was an asset to the Royal Air Force and it helped the, the, the bomber boys when they came home. It helped them to be treated with emotional sensitivity um, and to be treated gently. And the WAF knew how to coax this information out of the bomber crews, how to get them to give up what they knew without traumatizing them further. And actually that was incredibly important this is one of the map keepers at work. And this is a lady by the name of Faye Gillen with magnificent hair. Um, and she is debriefing a bomber crew there. She is working with a Canadian bomber crew who have just come back from an operation. They all look a bit stressed. She's very gently and very carefully drawing information out of them about the raid. Do we need to do the follow-up raid? Have we accomplished the mission aims? Um, and this woman in particular is fascinating. She's in the book, actually, because she is the only woman to have flown with Guy Gibson and the Dam Busters of 617 Squadron, who famously took out the Ruhr Valley Dams in Germany. Um, controversial raid. But Faye Gillen is her name, and she flew on several practice missions with the Dam Busters. That probably doesn't make sense to most of us. It doesn't actually make a whole lot of sense to me. And I've spent years writing this book. That is an aerial reconnaissance photo. So that is a picture that has been taken from several thousand feet of what the earth looks like below. Um, a lot of work that intelligence WAF carried out was in the realm of photographic intelligence and interpretation. Again, that's not very clear to me or to you probably, but these women working in photographic intelligence learned to see something where most people would see nothing. And what that circle is around is the first identification of a German V1 weapon, a pilotless aircraft loaded with incendiaries um, that the Allies managed to positively identify. And that was found by a woman. This is Constance Babington Smith. She's a Women's Auxiliary Air Force officer. And she worked at a place called RAF Medmanum, which is where they carried out a lot of photographic interpretation and intelligence work. And Constance noticed on an aerial photograph, a tiny little blob, a spot on a long shape. And she was bothered by it because it looked out of the ordinary. So she, you know, she worked over a few days to try and establish what it was. And she took it to her superiors who said, oh, don't worry about it. Um, it's equipment to dredge the lake, to deal with the lake, clean the lake up. What it actually was, and thank goodness, Constance didn't stop when she was told to by her superiors. What it actually was, was a launch ramp 
with a V1 pilotless aircraft actually sitting on it. Um, and she, is, she and her team, because intelligence is always a team effort, they are credited with locating it and identifying it, which led to 96 other sites being identified um, where these very dangerous weapons were being developed and launched toward London. Uh, some of them did make it, some of them were launched. My grandmother was injured by one of them in London during the Second World War. She survived, uh, but some, some people didn't, thousands of people didn't. But because of the work that these women did, the Allied bomber forces managed to eradicate all of those sites and the V-weapon threat uh, for good. So she is stood at a desk with a ruler, looks like she's doing clerical work, um, but actually she is responsible with her team of WAF and, and men of the Royal Air Force for stopping one of the gravest bombing threats this country faced during the Second World War. This lady, is one of my personal favourites, and I'm guessing Dr. Saloon might know who she is if you've looked into the SOE. Special Operations Executive is odd. It's a strange unit. It's called Churchill's Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare. That's what he calls it, because the British have this rather silly idea in the Second World War about being gentlemanly. It's not gentlemanly to listen to other people's messages or to read other people's mail. Um, it's not gentlemanly to go around blowing them up or killing them from behind with your bare hands. Um, you know, he's got a point. It's not gentlemanly. But when you are fighting an enemy that has absolutely no regard for the Geneva Convention or anything like it, um, Churchill's argument is we have to fight fire with fire. So he creates this odd unit called the Special Operations Executive. And it is the only unit in the Second World War to train women as killers intentionally. Um, this is a sabotage unit. So the SOE is set up to basically carry out sabotage in German occupied areas uh, to inhibit their ability to fight um, and to aid resistance movements. So 39 women are recruited into the section of the SOE that deals with occupied France. They are parachute dropped in the middle of the night into occupied France um, with the aim of supporting the French resistance and collecting intelligence that will help the British to fight the Germans. This woman is Noor Inyat Khan. She is technically an Indian princess. Uh, she is British American, she's got very mixed heritage, um, but she joins the SOE. All of the women who joined had to volunteer to do so. They were specially selected. Um, but this, if, if you thought it was uncomfortable to see a woman in a, in a military uniform handling a barrage balloon or working on an aircraft, this is unspeakable. They are trained to use high explosives. They are trained to use weapons. Uh, they are trained to kill with their bare hands, apparently, um, and all kinds of, of work that you just would not um, hear of a woman doing at this time. Nor is sent into occupied France. Um, she is told, as are all SOE operatives, you have around a 50% chance of coming home. Um, and it's very likely, as a wireless operator, that you will last around six weeks until you are caught, probably tortured and probably killed. Do you still want to go? Um, and her answer was yes, because she was incredibly brave. So Noor went out to occupy France and she actually lasted several months as a radar op a, a radio operator. So she is moving around constantly, um, sending classified information back to Great Britain on bombing targets and Noor specifically is responsible for a number of allied pilots being able to get back to Britain who have been shot down um, over German occupied territory. So lives were saved because of her work. Ultimately, um, Noor was caught, not through any fault of her own. Uh, she was betrayed and she was 
kept in solitary confinement for several months, very badly tortured, um, incredibly brave. There is actually, I have seen a file in the National Archives from a German commandant of one of the camps that she was kept in. And he said, it didn't matter what we did to her, we could not get her to talk. Um, so one of the reasons, the other reasons, because we're collecting a few now, aren't we? One of the other reasons that the British establish, establishment did not want women in intelligence work is because they did not believe that they were capable of keeping secrets nor kept secrets when unspeakable things were done to her. She never ever gave them anything of use uh, and she was shot in the back of the head and executed. Pearl uh, Wetherington- Sarah, my... sorry, sorry to interrupt you uh, reluctantly. I have to remind you that you have only a few more minutes left. Wrapping up, thank you. Pearl Wetherington is my second favourite. She ended up, uh, she's an SOE agent, she ended up in charge of a unit of the French resistance, um, randomly with her fiancé, Henry. They romantically led a, a unit of the French resistance and was responsible for blowing up hundreds of sections of German uh, of, of occupied railway to inhibit um, German reinforcements getting to the Normandy beaches on D-Day. Here's some evidence of um, the British authorities not realizing how good women were at keeping secrets. Um, they are depicted as kind of blabberer, you know, gossipy, incapable of keeping quiet. And these are actual propaganda posters from the Second World War that give, you know, give the idea that that's what people think. As did Marta Hari. Uh, Marta Hari is a famous World War uh, One spy who was shot for espionage uh, and that kind of all worked together to create the idea but I hope that you've seen through this lecture that that was absolute rubbish and that actually they were very good at keeping secrets. So to close, <clears throat> why does any of this matter? This is not just history. Um, we, we have still an imbalance in the intelligence world uh, where women are concerned. It's much better than it's ever been and there has been definite acknowledgement that women are an asset to the intelligence world and that they are very capable intelligence officers. In 2018, less than 24% of higher ranking officers in MI6 were women. Um, and this advertisement, for the first time in MI6's history, they publicly advertised for uh, personnel. This advert shows a woman and a child because they're trying to get across this idea that they want women in the intelligence services, that they are an asset. Um, and interestingly, this article actually said, we want your emotional sensitivity. We want your intuition because you are you know, more capable of dealing with um, certain issues in the intelligence world. So there's this kind of, you know, decades later, this acknowledgement that some of the things that make women women are actually an asset to the intelligence services. And this goes on. Uh, this is not a story that's finished. And I believe that the, the history of women in intelligence is very important to us understanding the situation today and continuing to work toward full integration and equality in the intelligence services and in the military services. Um, and that is an ongoing process and it's one that has you know, achieved quite a lot of progress in Great Britain in the last couple of decades, but we're not finished. There's plenty of work left to do and we have an incredible um, historical precedent to follow in the form of the women that I've been speaking about today. That's me done. Thank you so much for having me. It has been a great pleasure to talk to you. Thank you very much, Sarah, for this fantastic lecture. And it's very inform informative as well. Um, I have, uh, before I open the uh, platform to, uh, to questions from the panel on Zoom and also from um, our um, followers on social media channels, I wanted to ask you, why is it important to unearth the history or the historical role of this unflappable, I like this word, of, of this unflappable woman 
Uh, uh, why is it important for women who want to join the uh, intelligence community or part of the intelligence community? And I have a second question, if you may. Um, read in your book, I, I didn't finish it, and I recommend everybody to buy a copy. It's, it's a fantastic uh, book. And I also, um, I, you mentioned um, at the end um, that women were accused of being emotional. I think he dedicated a whole chapter for that. Uh, and I still remember uh, stay calm and carry on or something. Uh, that was the motto. Uh, why Winston Churchill was so keen on allowing women, women into these very dangerous roles, despite objections from the British authorities and the military? Both very good questions. Um, I think to answer one, you have to answer the other actually. So Winston Churchill was notoriously forward thinking in some ways. Um, he was kind of an oddball. Um, so he he thought outside of the box. And I and one of the reasons that he he ended up um, advocating for women in the intelligence world was his belief that they were underestimated by the enemy. Um, because if they were underestimated at home, they were surely underestimated by the enemy. Um, which was true. Actually, one of the German, uh, I think it was a member of the German Air Force, said on record in public that women had smaller brains, so they weren't as intelligent. Um, that's what he thought. And Churchill thought, if we send women in, they will not expect them to be spies. They will not expect them to be capable of this work. Um, so it was almost kind of playing on the underestimation um, and I think that that is something that's never really gone away in the intelligence world. You don't expect um, a woman and a child to be, you know, a, a threat or a spy in the same way that you might a man. Um, and I think that that kind of underestimation and misunderstanding of what women are capable of um, was quite useful in that way. And Churchill saw that. If women are wanting to join the intelligence services today, that kind of, you know, long standing idea that they shouldn't or can't be a part of that world can even deter them. Um, it can it can make them feel like it's not the right world for them. Um, and I think part of writing this book for me was about showing women and girls that the intelligence world absolutely needs them and that the reasons the authorities didn't want them in intelligence work are actually reasons why they'd be so good at it, which MI6 has actually recognised um, in, in its advert there. So I think, you know, the underestimation of women is probably an ongoing thing, um, but it's also a reason why they're probably quite effective um, at their jobs in the intel world. Thank you very much. I open the floor now for questions uh, for everybody available on... Um... On Zoom, Dr. Aymad, I can see you have a raised hand. Thank you very much. Uh, really, Sarah, it's a, it's a fascinating, really, topic. Um, I have a question, really, about the, the social context of this, uh, of this information. So um, is there sort of a systematic way to, to bring about this information that you have and to engage it really societally, meaning to try to alter uh, uh, public understandings, maybe shed light on this era in a, in a broader way. Um, um, uh, and how do you think uh, this could be carried on really more systematically? Meaning what are some of the moves uh, to change really public uh, public opinion or public understanding or public awareness even of those and 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 do you think that that will have a feedback of a, a effect on the intelligence community itself thank you another good question i have a personal obsession with with this with doing exactly what you just mentioned um i think it's necessary and it's something that I, I spend most of my time at the moment trying to do. So I work at the Defence Studies Department at King's College London, um, and I'm always talking about it there, um, and over at Oxford as well. And one of the ways in which I do that is by talking about methodology. And most people don't want to hear about methodology because it's, it's not super interesting to everyone. But I think one of the main problems we've had 
is confining this history to a specific bracket. So, you know, I, I spoke at a conference a couple of weeks ago and my paper was put in in a, a group called Gender and the Sea. So I was talking about Wrens. And that frustrated me because I thought, you know, as soon as you see the word women in the title of a book or a paper, you think gender and you think, um, you know, cultural history or um, women's history. And it's separate. We keep it separate. And there's a problem there because while we keep it separate, not everyone is exposed to it. It's quite a small section of, of society is interested in women's history but lots of people are interested in war history lots of people are interested in military history and intelligence and espionage because they're sexy subjects you know they're kind of interesting um and it, if we keep taking women out and doing it separately they are not going to be understood in the context of war and intelligence and military service so i think that one of the ways we can tackle this is to put it back in its rightful context and say, you know, they were involved in war, they were involved in killing, um, they, they are involved in the military, they always have been. Um, and the way that we talk about those subjects bring women back into them, even down to a television programme. If you go onto National Geographic, there's 15 different programmes on Hitler and the Nazis, but there are none on the role of women in war. Um, and if you get a documentary, I, I speak on documentaries all the time on television, and it's an argument every time to have women included in the context of war and military service. So I think it's really about reframing it um, and reconceptualizing their work in every possible opportunity and way. Um, but that methodology is, is a big part of, of how we do that. Perfect. Thank you, Sarah. Um, do we have anybody else on Zoom or should I move to social media? Right, so we have a question from social media uh, from Zahir. Do you see that there were um, there were differences between the British women and other European women in terms uh, of their role in the war? Good question. Yes, um, there are differences around the world, as you'd expect. Um, there were countries that followed pretty much the British approach. Um, so a lot of them are Commonwealth countries um, and you get the kind of equivalent services in Canada, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, lots of places, America. Um, in Europe, it's different. So obviously, it's occupied a lot of it um, at different times during the war. So the, the, the Soviet Union is quite fascinating in terms of studying what women did because they actually were willing to put women in uniform as snipers and fighter pilots. Um, who were much more kind of closer to the tip of the sphere in terms of the kill chain. They were killing, um, where it was much more indirect in Britain. So there's a, a deeper level of discomfort with, with actual kind of engagement um, in Britain. The Soviet Union is a very interesting study for anyone interested in this topic. You got the night witches who flew fighter missions and then um, snipers, like I said, there's frontline soldiers, quite different. The Germans, uh, like I said, underestimated women quite badly. Um, so they, they didn't use them as much as they could have. They did use them because, you know, they had the same kind of manpower issues that we did. Um, but it was with greater reluctance and much less scope um, to allow them to be involved. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, I'm afraid that we're already 10 minutes over time. And uh, I thank you again for joining us, despite the fact that you are not feeling very well. And uh, thank you for this fantastic uh, lecture. And it's very informative and inspirational to, I'm sure, to many of my students, our students here at the Doha Institute for Graduate Studies and the region. And we would uh, love to have you again in the future. Thank you very much for all the viewers and viewers. عبر منصات التواصل الاجتماعي وعبر منصة زوم وندعوكم إلى متابعة محاضرات وندوات المركز العربي للدراسات للأبحاث ودراسة السياسات ونلتقيكم في محاضرات قادمة لوحدة الدراسات الاستراتيجية إن شاء الله Thank you Sarah Thank you Sarah Thank you Thank you Thank you Thank you Thank you Thank you Thank you